Hello and welcome to the Writer's Mindset with me, Christina Adams. And me, Ellie Betts. Each week we're here to help you persevere through the tough times, be your most productive self and get that work in progress published. Wherever you are in your publishing journey, we've got your back. This week we are talking to Gail Carragher about analytics for authors, but in a non-scary way, I promise. There's no such thing you're completely making it up, Ellie Goley Writer. There is a such thing. I promise you everything's going to be fine in Gail's very capable hands. Okay, I I will admit Gail is capable. That's as far as I'm going. I don't (laughs) think numbers are not scary ever. Big shout out to our podcast patrons for all of your support. As a patron, you'll get early access to episodes, the chance to submit questions for our guests, and access to our bonus series, Healthy Habits. Healthy Habits isn't your typical productivity advice. We're not here to tell you to get up at 4am and go for a three-hour run. Hell no. We're exploring the latest research to find small changes you can make in your life to be happier, healthier, and more productive in your writing life and beyond. To start developing healthier habits today, Come join our community at patreon.com forward slash writers mindset. So returning this week is the lovely Gail Carragher. Welcome back to the Writers Mindset. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I cannot tell you how excited I am to be here for this discussion. It, it Yeah, it's like a, a dream come true. <laughs> so can you just give our listeners a little bit of a refresher about who you are and what you do and also... What it is that you love about data and analytics and tracking and numbers and all the scary logical things that a lot of us <laughs> creatives, frankly myself included, know we should do, but don't do for all the reasons I just listed. <laughs> um, all right. Well, hello. My name is Gail Carragher. I uh, write steampunk, uh, sci-fi, fantasy, young adult, all sorts of stuff. Uh, That's how I make my living. I'm a full-time six-figure author. Um, This is where I like prove my point so that maybe you think I'm an agent of trust. I am wide and hybrid, although I haven't been published with a traditional publisher in a while. I have um, a little over a dozen New York Times bestsellers. I'm in about 20 different languages and uh, multiple different formats and things like that. I have experience with the whole range of author life from Hollywood movie deals to being adapted into a graphic novel. I'm very focused on organic sales because I come to being a hybrid author from a traditional platform. Also, I'm very, very lazy. So my perspective tends to be trying to rig up organic sales as much as possible so that it does all the work for me. uh, So that anytime I write something new, that kind of acts as a booster slash advertising for my entire back catalog, which means I do, I have played with, but I do very little uh, paid advertising. That's just not really part of my business model. I do paid advertising for other reasons. Uh, One of them being tracking things and (laughs) understanding data. I write, so I earn my living full-time as an author and I do that by producing less than three books a year. It's usually one novel, and a novella of some kind and then a weird experimental project because I like to play with things like for example I haven't but I could do something like a cookbook that ties into my world and I and and I entirely support myself on my my fiction writing income although I also do write nonfiction and I do speaking and presenting stuff like that too uh so there it is that's me quite the list of achievements there very oh 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 You asked me why I like uh, data uh, and data analysts. And uh, that is because I'm a social scientist by training. I think Um, I've always enjoyed numbers because they don't lie, uh, although they can be made to lie if you study stats. So I have a minor in stats um, and that's part of my training. I come out of archeology span and archeology span has a lot of logistics involved in it. It's one of the more science heavy of the social sciences if you think about it. Um, And so I love, love, love spreadsheets. Uh, They make me very happy. I like organizing data. Um, I like color coding things. I kind of write this way too. I am a big Scrivener fan because I'm very visual and I kind of organize things and modularize things and that just makes me really happy. Um, And why do I like it so much? I think because uh, I'm a bit of a control freak. And um, if you know your data really well, you can allocate both money and time 
much better. So essentially, it just allows me to be as efficient as possible. So um, I don't want to waste my time, for example, on a social media platform, if it's not actually effective for my author career. And understanding data and following the data allows me to make those decisions confidently to abandon something like Twitter, or to turn it into an outpost, because even though I'm getting clicks, I'm not getting conversions, that kind of thing. So that's that's um, mostly why I am a big fan of analytics and looking at analytics from an author perspective, because it allows me how to best spend my energy, which is relatively limited. Absolutely. And it's it's such a worthwhile thing to do to make sure you're spending those energy in the right places. We were talking in a previous episode about how we need to look into these data analytics some more. And then Gail very kindly got in touch and offered to help us all out and go through it all. So um, we will dive into the delicious data that that was off the cuff. I didn't even plan that. Uh, <laughs> what data should authors be tracking and what are the benefits of doing that? Okay, so the first thing that I think most uh, laymen, shall we say, don't understand if you don't come out of a, a sort of statistics or a data analytics, uh, data analysis background is um, there's a difference between demographics and analytics. And it's actually a really good idea for an author to access both of these things. So um, demographics tends to be data that's provided by an aggregator or it's information that you have gathered and then aggregated through experience like surveys, on the ground research, um, and then these will be things that you may or may not collate yourself. So uh, demographics is things like your readers, general age, gender, income brackets, um, but it also includes things like comparative titles and comparative authors, what we would call comps for as as authors. And so you're and, and so this can play into metadata and keywords. So you're probably somewhat familiar with your reader base's demographics if you have any contact with them. And these can be very broad scope. So if you write romance, you know you're targeting a specific gender range demographic most of the time. And so that's what demographics mean. Whereas analytics is data that's provided by a platform on your specific audience within that platform's ecosystem. So Google may provide you with analytics about the searches around your name and connected to your website, your SEO. WordPress may provide you with analytics on the number of visitors that you're getting, the bounce rates, stuff like that. Your newsletter handler, which is probably the analytics you're most familiar with, will provide you with information about the open right and number of click throughs. So analytics can be converted into demographics, but only if you have access to data from more than one author. In other words, uh, in order to get demographic info on your genre, you need to be talking to and sharing this kind of information with other authors who also write in your genre, which is one of the many reasons I like to encourage authors to really like at least try to look into some of this information because the more information you have on your own career and are able to exchange and share with other authors, the more power you have under any given circumstance because you know this is all information. Um, and then that's, that is of course a way that we can protect ourselves from being taken advantage of from publishers, vendors, et cetera, et cetera. So, but yeah, data and analytics are, uh, demographics and analytics are both data, but they're slightly different and they kind of are used in different ways. And you are probably accessing both of them already. Uh, if you if you have started your career as an author, you just don't really realize it or you're maybe ignoring them or something. And I take it by the sounds of it then, um, of what you explained there, they're both kind of equally as important, but it's just, mm -hmm. it's just important to also clarify that they're different aspects. Yeah. Um, and at its base level, analytics tells you if you're familiar, if you have an MBA and you're familiar with this kind of thing, analytics is much more tied to a one-on-one -on -one relationship with your reader, which means it's more to do with sales. Um, whereas demographics is more to do with understanding a broader reader base, which means it's more to do with marketing. So if you're doing thinking of something in terms of like uh, uh, take doing an ad advertisement campaign or something, you're probably going to be looking more at demographics. But if you're thinking about something like what kind of newsletter bait you should offer to your specific reader, Readers, then you're probably going to be thinking more in terms of analytics. Very interesting. I like that. With regards to that data then that you are tracking, how in depth do you go with that? How in depth should people be going? So I 
think it's really important. And again, I think this is probably because I come out of the social science it, for the author to understand what their question is. Otherwise, you're just sort of gathering a lot of data and you don't really know why you're doing it or what you're doing. So I tend to go into what I so I do actually have what I would call maintenance analytics and like maintenance sales data that I gather that just I mostly use and we can go into this, but I mostly look at like per week kind of a short list of things. And it's mostly just to see if there's a red flag of some kind, like, like, do I get a spike? for some reason and why, or do I get a drop for some reason and why? So that's that's kind of maintenance, but that's a sort of different thing. Um, when I'm really targeting or collecting data, that's because I have a specific question that I want answered. And that question should be a, a, a SMART goal of some kind, S-M-A-R-T, which means you want a very specific answer to a very specific question. And that can be a question like, which social media platform is the most effective for actually selling a book rather than for and which is or which is the most effective for getting the word out about a book. So those are the kind of questions you might ask yourself. Um, and so some of the things that I track are like I use website redirects a lot. And trust me, we'll be going back to this. But you might be thinking about um, what's an effective newsletter bait or um what increases new subs to your newsletter or decreases them. Uh, you can use surveys for quick gathering of data. Um, I survey my readers all the time just because I tend to have a lot of them and now they sort of exist in one ecosphere. So there's like a bunch of them I can just tap whenever I feel like it. And then I uh, look at Google Analytics a lot. That's because one of my like overarching strategies, which I talked about being a, a person who relies on organic sales is trying to get people on my newsletter as much as possible. So like, that's kind of the point of view of my online presence. And therefore it's also the point of view of my website is to get people on the newsletter. Um, and therefore like how many people visit my website is also kind of tied to how many people are getting on my newsletter. I also track other uh, sort of the popularity of other things like my Instagram posts, uh, my st Tumblr stats, uh, my Wikia data stats, and then occasionally I'll take a look at some of my Outpost social medias. Outpost basically means it's a platform upon which I exist, but it's mostly not a platform I engage with. It acts kind of like a vehicle to get people back over to my website. Um, Th that's how I use Pinterest, for example. So Do pretty you... in depth, I guess. <laughs> I like it. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of what I thought you were going to say. <laughs> but I just thought it was worth sharing as well. Do you have kind of like a, a list of all the different data sources you use? Can you just run through that briefly at all? Okay, so I would say the data sources I rely on the most, so like the weekly ones that I check in pretty regularly are Google Analytics with the website. And then I use a WordPress plugin for my website called redirection and I check in with redirection pretty regularly um it, I would call that probably the most vital tool I have that I have applied myself I look at my newsletter on a weekly basis how many subs and unsubs and I have a onboarding survey so I take a look at my survey answers every week as well like I said the Google Analytics specifically with Google I'm looking at top pages I do a blog so knowing which blogs are popular is useful to me, especially if it's an old one that suddenly becomes popular, did was somebody talking about it? Is the end matter for that blog post uh, directing people to my newsletter or to the latest book or whatever I want to direct them to? It also tells me what my search algorithms are like, my you know, for my for vanity alerts and things like that. It also tells me which of my outposts are the most effective. If you're looking at your Google Analytics, it will give you basically a list of where all the traffic is coming to your blog. And uh, I'm always very pleased to see Pinterest right up there, even though I'm not really active there. It means people are pinning my blog posts and coming to my website from Pinterest. And then like, and then I look at uh, the top three IG posts. That's because I repurpose content a lot. So a really popular Instagram post is probably going to end up in my newsletter because my fan base has already told me they like that image. So I might as well reuse it. Tumblr and Wikia are kind of weird things that only I use, uh, but I just keep an eye on them anyway. And then I also utilize reader surveys like I talked about. I would say I do those monthly. And sometimes they're information I'm really very interested about my reader base as, a, as the primary demographic I have direct access to. 
And so I will ask them things like, uh, you know, there was a recent uh, big debate over the nature of hardbacks because Barnes and Noble is phasing out hardbacks for debut authors. And there's a lot of discussion to be had around this, but I was genuinely curious how my reader base felt about hardbacks. It's like everybody was talking about it from the back end, from the traditional publishing side of the equation. No one had really just gone to the readers and been like, how do you interface with hardbacks now, as opposed to how you used to? And, and most of them said, something which I um, I resonate with myself and have noticed as an author, but also have kind of seen trending over the years, which is they collect art hardbacks as kind of a luxury scarcity thing now. They're, they aren't likely to buy a newer author in hardcover. So I'm like, that's a trend that I recognize, but now I put it out to 40,000 fan group and, and, and got some actual, you know, 5,000 people responded and I was like well that's pretty decent data from a, a core group of readers to to say yeah a lot of people are, are kind of moving off of of hardcover and some of that's age of my reader base who like they're like yeah the it's physically hard to hold them up and it, with the onset of e-readers I can enlarge the font so like you can have a real quality as well as quantity discussion so quantitative analysis versus qualitative analysis um, if you're running a survey so um and and sometimes those surveys are just silly little polls like which pasta shape do you like more but uh, <laughs> you know, hey the uh, hardback thing is not just about age i just got tiny hands man i can't read that book for very long it's yeah hard work. I, my <laughs> well i'm i'm a writer right so my wrists get really easily fatigued yeah. so it's just hard for me to hold it up yeah personally. i can barely hold a paperback open with one hand never mind about bloody hardback <laughs> yeah, hardback, <laughs> it's, yeah it's impossible <laughs> yeah the time i bought a hardback was because it had a really pretty cover and it's actually an, almost like an a5 size so Ooh, it's big. fine to hold because uh, it's not like as gigantic as your average hardback release and to be uh, fair yeah. it is the woman in black so it's not like it's a new release and it's quite a short book as well i think yeah that's the that's the collector thing um you know and and social media has had an impact on that as well specifically instagram which is a demographic so millennials are, are a lot of millennials are on instagram and so they are also coming around to liking pretty hardbacks in particular and becoming collectors also as they age into much higher levels of disposable income and things like that so I, I mean you, it's just really interesting to watch kind of trend I've been in this business for over a decade now and so watching the way trends move is interesting and you can do that with this kind of tracking and then we're still on the things I track I also keyword track and by that I mean I'll bop into some of the places that I harvest keywords and comp authors and comp titles from um, in order to see which who I'm being associated with, for example. And I'll do that about once a month and I just have a big old keyword document. And I think I keep them all there for possible future advertising campaigns. I haven't done an ad campaign in, in like three or four years, but also just to be like, just to see who I'm, who like my brand, what other authors I'm being associated with for lack of a better term. Um, and I should say I do that and I, everybody should think about this if you have it, which is I do that, uh, I do my comp titles on Audible more often than not in incognito mode because it's a cleaner catch these days for someone like me who's a, who's a wide um, hybrid author because it, it Audible is not going to be polluted by KU or anything else similar. Since I'm not in KU, my reader base is different and therefore I can't really use those keywords and comp titles because we don't have a lot of crossover buyers. Um, so yeah, so those are some of the things I track. Um, and then for sales data weekly, I track mostly just Amazon, uh, KDP and um, ACX. And then I also look at my returns in those venues because I find that data particularly interesting. And the fact that they bury it means that I should probably keep a pretty close eye on it. <laughs> That is a lot of data to be tracking. <laughs> um, it actually works out. It's pretty streamlined. So it works out to just a, you know, just a few things. I, I basically just have like a, a systems little sheet that says check here, check here, check here, check here, check here. And then I take a look at the weekly in each venue that I can and then 
you know, that's it. And it's just like a, a Friday thing. It's a lot more intense and focused and more daily tracking when I have a launch because uh, I do pre-ordered launches. And that means that I can track everything very, very meticulously, especially through Amazon, since Amazon, Amazon will report your pre-orders every single day. So for me, doing a pre-order is really important because it's the most access I have to click to conversion rates. Um, and I admit it is click to pre-order conversions, um, which is a lot harder for uh, less established authors to do because pre-orders rely on an existing fan base that trusts you and has faith in your books and is willing to pre-order from you. So most of the data that I collect from that kind of thing is just where are my existing fans more than anything. And my existing fans who are willing to buy, where are they hanging out more than anything? But it is the best direct data that I have for launch tracking. So I am almost always tracking a launch to some degree. And sometimes I'm doing very strategically and sometimes I'm just launching into the world. But um, yeah, so launch tracking is something that I love and I will create pie charts and stuff like that. <laughs> like Because it allows me to genuinely figure out where my fans are that are true fans willing to buy a book from me um, and where it's just I have a ton of followers, but they just want to talk about uh, the book industry, for example, <laughs> Twitter, and they're not actually going to buy my books. So uh, if that if I'm on social media in order to interface with my readers and my true fans, which is why I am on social media, then it allows me to know where to spend my time the most. That's obviously a lot of things to track is mm. there like a minimum you think someone should be tracking if they're going oh my god i can't do that my brain's gonna explode please just like end me now like what would you say is the absolute minimum to ease someone into the tracking concept sure i would say um so i have a a presentation that i do which is like every author should want w-a-n-t so if you're going hybrid or if you're going if you're starting from indie whatever it is w-a-n-t is you need to have a website um uh, a is Amazon Author Central. You need to control your identity on Amazon Author Central. Um, and I'm sorry, I, like I shouldn't be using like you needs, but I, I genuinely believe that uh, you're kind of an idiot if you're not doing these things. So uh, your own website, the reason you need your own website is it's a unidirectional portal. It is a place where you can house everything. If you do take off and become very, very popular, you need to be able to have a corner of the internet that is yours that you can control. So that's why you need your own website. Amazon Author Central, because it is your visual portal to all of your Amazon readers who are historically the hardest to onboard to a newsletter. So controlling that ecosystem is super important. And it will be for most of us, the majority of our income from an indie stream. But as a traditionally published author, you need to control your um, Amazon Author Central as well, because it is um, the place where you are authenticated and validated in the reader's eyes. Um, so if you eventually do decide to go hybrid, or if you want to pu publish a short story or something, Amazon believes that you really exist if you own if you own your own identity there. Um, because and, otherwise, and you, you're just pretending to be an author. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> you're not on Amazon. Trust you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, even if your books are on Amazon from a different vendor, just go in, and, in other words, from your traditional publisher, just go in and claim them as yours. Just give yourself an identity there. Like, make sure they know you're a real author. And then uh, WAN is a newsletter. I'm sorry. Uh, yes, there are definitely demographics that are really hard to get onto a newsletter, Very young, the youngest demographics. If you write YA, it's pretty difficult. Uh, but a newsletter is your only direct access to... Um, to your super fans and eyeballs that cannot be shut down by Amazon or uh, <laughs> anything else. So, um, and you get to keep all of those email addresses. You can download them and save them and move them to a different newsletter handler if you like. So like newsletter is super important. I'm sure you guys have discussed that before. And then T, I think every author should have two social media presences and they can be whatever two social medias you enjoy the most. Um, and that is mostly because I use those presences for data collecting <laughs> and testing and talking to people and stuff. So that's the WANT. So knowing that that's my perspe perspective on this, um, to answer your question on what is the most limited thing you should have, you should be interfacing with and tracking or at least looking at 
your Google Analytics for your website. So your search rankings and those sorts of things and understanding what that means, at least to some extent, and your newsletter analytics. Those are the two that are like the most important for you to have access to. Because if your goal is to get people to find you, join your newsletter, um, interface with you as a super fan of some kind, then you need to know what you're doing to achieve that goal. Um, and the only way to know if what you're doing is effective is understanding those two analytics centers. So those are the two I would say. So being familiar with your newsletters analytics and your website's analytics. We do have two really good episodes on newsletters, actually. We've got Tammy LeBrac talking about reader magnets. Great. And we've got Robin Kennedy talking about email marketing psychology, which is a lot more fun than it sounds. And they're also two of the funniest people I know. Yes. So definitely check them out because they are absolutely uh, excuse me I, I thought i was supposed to be the funniest person you know um what um you're the, you're the funniest person i speak to on a daily basis oh yeah that's a great accolade yeah <laughs> that, that doesn't work my bright my this cold ruined me i haven't got a back on that <laughs> i love you ellie <laughs> good answer <laughs> She's just glaring at me, stroking her cat. Like <laughs> just, just some sort of evil villain in the corner, stroking my cat like. Mm. And Cosmo blends into your top. Oh, it's purring! Oh, there's a purring! Oh, can you hear him? <gasps> yes! Oh my god, that's the best thing ever. Yeah. Oh, oh, god, oh. oh <laughs> moment. He is now about seven months old. Oh my gosh, he's a bear. He's a bi- he's a big boy. Look at him. Yeah. Oh my god. Big he's baby. Big yeah. Baby. He's got big paws. Her. Yeah, he was just meowing. So he's like, pick me up, pick me up. I'm like, okay. Just I meow. have the opposite, was which is a tiny cat with the quietest purr in the in the <laughs> world. You can only feel her purr. You can very rarely hear it. Oh, see, Frankie really is a massive cat. And he does purr, but like, see, you have to feel it. He doesn't do it that often either. But Cosmo, yeah, he's the little purr machine. Excellent. Love it. Love it. So... How does all of this data guide or influence the career choices that you make in the short and the long term? Depending on what kind of author you are and what market you are targeting is definitely going to sort of dictate what you want to track, for example, much in the same way as it would dictate what you might offer as newsletter um, for your newsletter onboarding sequence or your magnet. Um, I call it bait because I'm aggressive. So, you know, for example, like like I said, my point of view is as a, a wide hybrid author who can only produce a certain number of books a year. Now, if I were a indie exclusive KU author who wrote one book a month or something like that, what data I want to track and my perspective would be entirely different, right? I would be much more interested. I would be enslaved to the Amazon ecosystem, not to be rude, but there it is. Uh, But that is a choice you can absolutely make, but it means very carefully tracking and monitoring that data and ensuring that you're not red flagging Amazon in any way. So also keeping a very close eye on the chatter in the indie sphere about what's causing stuff to be dungeoned in Amazon or knocked out of KU and that kind of a thing. So you want to be, you, you also might consider if you will eventually take your books out of KU, whether you want to have a wide strategy for some of your books in the future, in which case you might be more inclined to bifurcate your newsletter. So to have one newsletter that are explicitly for your KU customers and another one that's going to be for your wide customers when they happen, because they're going to want to buy different things. They're going to onboard for different reasons to your newsletter, that kind of thing. So you might be running analytics on two, what is what amounts to two newsletters, for example. So your approach is going to be materially different depending on what your business model is or what your career model is in terms of how fast you can write, which venues you want to be on, whether you're also traditionally published or not, those sorts of things. So yeah, it does, it really does make a difference. The the information you need to know is dictated by where you want to go and how you want to spend your time as a writer, but also because what demographics and analytics are telling you is about your audience and what you write and how you publish it, it impacts your audience, obviously. (laughs) So the two are inexorably linked. I mean, this is, for me, this is the fun thing about data is, I mean, obviously, again, I keep harping on this, but I come to this from a social science perspective. So it's what data can tell us about sort of the culture of the people 
that is your audience that's very very interesting to me uh i've been thinking a lot recently that like probably if i weren't an author data analyst would be something that i would love to be specifically in something like the entertainment industry or something because it's just very interesting to me how popular culture or pop culture inner acts with different audiences and fandoms and stuff I, I just find that very exciting and interesting and this is basically giving you information on your own fandom or your your own reader base and that I don't know who wouldn't want to know more about them right? exactly we're sold Gail like and I'm sure everyone <laughs> listening is absolutely sold on data analytics now so okay. Tell us then, what kind of tools and software are you using okay. to track all of this and to monitor it and to pull the data out? All right. So I should say there are some good aggregate softwares out there that kind of are really designed to help authors um, collect all of this, specifically if you're a wide author, because you're going to be on so many different platforms and stuff like that. Um, I don't use any of them. <laughs> So unfortunately, I can't recommend them. However, go. I'm guessing out. then, is it all just spreadsheets? Just spreadsheets. It's just <laughs> spreadsheets. Yeah, I just collect it myself. Um, I know it's terrible, uh, but I like it. Like I. It's like not it. terrible if that's the system that works for you. That's what we yeah. want to hear about, Gail. Obviously, it's a <laughs> successful system. But I do. But like, do check out um, uh, indie author. What's the in wide for the win? And then there's an indie author um, massive group and like 50 books, 50K and places like that um, th on Facebook in specifically will have discussions of different like aggregate tools like this. So um, they're, they're places to look for the ones that authors are particularly using or that are catering to authors. And it's probably a good idea to use one of those um, just because then there's other authors talking about this and you can go ask questions of them. Um, I use no aggregate tools. I just use spreadsheets and I just use a lot of the built-in. So Google Analytics or WordPress Analytics or whatever. Um, I will say there is one tool that I hard recommend and I can't emphasize this enough. Back when we talked about the things to do that are lightweight, that are the least barrier to entry, um, I mentioned that Google Anal Google or your WordPress analytics and then your newsletter analytics are probably the two you're going to be accessing the most. The one that I recommend most authors build in and utilize the most is a tool called Redirection. Now, everybody is probably familiar with um, using something like Bitly or a tiny URL or something, uh, a URL shortener that allows you to track um, where, where, whatever link you've posted is going. What a lot of people don't know, or what a lot of authors don't know is your WordPress site has a plugin that can do that as well. And it's called redirection. And basically it will allow you to build a link to anything that is your website's URL, and then whatever slug you want to give it. So whatever little tag work you want to give it. So for example, I have a book called The Heroine's Journey, which is a nonfiction book, and I have a redirection slug built into my website that's basically gailcarragher.com slash hj. And that is a very short URL I can say on something like a podcast. And if you typed it in, it would just redirect you to that book's landing page on my website. That's a very simple way a redirection works, but the beauty of redirection as a plugin and as a piece of software is that you can track everything with it. So if you want to run a test on anything, you can build a baby slug to that website. Um, and by that, I mean, um, so when I have a new book for sale, the redirection is going to point at that book's sales landing page. So for me, that's a book to read landing page, which basically has all the marketplaces that the book is going to be sold in because I have a wide author. If you are not a wide author, you might have that redirect go straight to your Amazon page, however you want to do it. But I use a redirection and the redirection is dedicated to whatever platform that is posted on. So I'll build a special redirection that basically says the book's name and then Facebook group, for example. And then when I post that I have a new book out and here's where you can buy it with the link, I use the redirection link. And then I can go to my website and see how many people clicked on that link specifically to buy the book, which basically is telling me 
how many people in the Facebook group were interested in looking at this new book of mine? And then I will do that for Twitter. How many people for Twitter were interested? Now, all of these people are being directed to the same place, but I'm being told by the link where they started out. And that's just telling me very specific information about where my interested people are. So this is just clicks. It's not necessarily people who actually buy the book. To track how where people are actually buying from, you need to roll this out on a temporal scale. So like you do Facebook group on Monday, Facebook page on Wednesday, Twitter on Friday, and then you see how many sales you get on the pre-order on Amazon for each of those days and that will give you it's very loose obviously it's just amazon specific and it's just um and of course people will have maybe have seen it elsewhere uh, but it is the only direct data we have for tracking purposes so anyway so but it's redirection this little tool that allows me to do all of this um it's it's just it's a very minor tool and it's just extremely powerful uh, so if you have a wordpress website which most authors do it's one of the best tools we have out there. Um, and so one of the things I do weekly is I bop over and check my redirects. And I just go in and look, organize them by date, see which ones are popular, hope that if I sent out a newsletter recently, those ones are right at the top because that means people engaged with the newsletter. Um, I take a look to see if there's an interesting spike in my redirects. Like, ooh, everybody's suddenly buying off this old link that's linked to an old blog post. What's going on there? Something like that. Um, it's, it's just a really, it's a really powerful little tracking tool. Um, and it's something that's your own website. So it's not tools like bit.ly or tiny URL similarly do this, but they're held by a middleman. You don't control that data. So, um, it's a lot easier just to have it as a plugin and I have a blog post about it. I think it's probably gailcarriger.com slash redirection, but also you can just Google Gail Carriger tool redirection or Gator, Gail Carriger redirection. And there I have a whole blog post about exactly how you set it up for a WordPress site and, um, you know, why, how you, if hearing me talking about it is overwhelming, it's all written out so you can realize why you might want to use it and stuff like that. So that's my hot tip. <laughs> is, is redirection. Don't let me do that until I'm over this cold because I'll break my website and you know it. <laughs> Yes, it, you're banned. <laughs> banned from editing websites until next week at least. Yeah, Absolutely. Go. Yes. Don't 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 do this. Like playing with redirect is something that you like you want to give yourself a nice afternoon when you're highly caffeinated and fully aware and uh you just want to play um and and see. And you can roll it out in a very limited manner. Um so for example, the first and most important redirect that you should have is to your newsletter subscription. Mm -hmm. And everywhere and every time you onboard somebody to your newsletter, it should be via a redirection because you might want to change who hosts your newsletter. <laughs> and mm -hmm. if you do that and you have all of your newsletter onboarding all over the web in your Amazon author profile and on your Facebook page or whatever, you have to remember where those all are on the internet and go and change them all. But if you have them all via redirect on your website, then all you have to do is search for that URL code and then change them all on your website. And the back, it's, it's all back end. Uh, this is also how you can handle front matter and back matter. Um, so for example, a lot of authors will claim that you should have newsletter signups at the beginning of your book and also at the end of your book so that people see the front matter sign up in your um, sample, for example. Uh, of your book. I've always wondered if this was true. Uh, and so I tracked it. So uh, you can sign up for my newsletter at the beginning of the group. It's a redirect that tells me that they came from the beginning of the book. And then you can sign up for my newsletter at the end. And it has a redirect that tells me that that person came from the end of my book. Um, and I can, in fact, tell you that for me and my readers, it is about 50-50. So of the signups I get for my newsletter from my front matter and my back matter, half of them are indeed coming from the front matter. So therefore, I keep that verbiage in all of my books because I know it's being effective. So you can do other things like, like occasionally people, especially if you have a wide back catalog like I do, occasionally people will say um, it's better to have a list of books 
of, of the next books in the series or whatever, if you have a lot of books. Um, in other words, it's better to have an also buy after the last page of your book. Whereas other people will say, no, no, you should put a sample of the next book in the series and then a buy button at the end of that sample. Well, I test it. <laughs> so some of my books have samples in them and some of my books have an also buy list in them. And then some of them uh, are exclusively to onboard onto my newsletter. And then I see which ones seem to be the most effective. Now, it's not a perfect A-B test because different books, different series, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But it is, you know, useful information to have when somebody like claims that this is the most effective tactic. And I can be like, for me, actually, uh, the sample chapter works best. So oh, the power, I love the power and all of that. That's excellent. I love it. Yeah. And that's all tracked through redirection. That's how I know that information. Um, so yeah, it's very, effect I also know uh, which books, are, so I will s switch out my sample chapters. So I know which books onboard a new series better than others. So, um, so I have three different universes that I write in a urban fantasy universe, a historical universe, and a uh, far, a far future sci-fi universe, but I would like my readers to move between those. Now, genre readers are historically pretty dedicated to just the genre that I like, but I'm pretty sure that my voice is, as a writer is very specific tonally and that my readers, if I can convince them, will pretty happily follow me between genres. And that's just because I talk to them all the time. And I can't tell you how many times someone has said, like, I hate YA, but I finally tried your YA and I love it. And I'm like, that's because it's still me, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, so knowing, for example, that I should onboard from my urban fantasy series to my sci-fi series um, and from my historical to my urban fantasy, but only in very specific books is also really useful because the readers will give that sample a try. Um, in some books, but not in others. So like tracking that is also. So I always, I always, my little redirections will tell me that it's a sample and which book it came from and which book it was leading to so that I know, um, what, again, what's being effective. This is all what's being effective. Now, this is really in-depth stuff. <laughs> and it's because I have so many books to play with and I like playing with my own career and I can risk it. But it is in the end, this is the kind of tactic that you can use for a time-saving tactic. So especially when you're tracking a launch, knowing, for example, which I do now, that Twitter is not an effective launch platform for me. Um, I like Twitter. I enjoy talking to my fellow authors on Twitter. It is a pretty good way to access other authors, but my particular readers just aren't really hanging out there. And even if they are, they're not buying off of that platform. So it doesn't make sense for me to, yes, I'll tell them when I have a new book out, um, but I don't have really push it there. And I just don't hang out there as much as I used to, uh, because for me, that ends up being a waste of time. My time is going to be better spent on some of the other platforms. And I made that choice about, you know, I, like I basically I'm like, I have an hour to spend on social media a day, half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening. It has to be spent wisely. Twitter's out. Twitter gets five minutes, you know? Um, and I made that choice after tracking a number of launches. So that is how it, this kind of thing can be useful is it, it will guide um, how you best spend your time when you get to a point career-wise where how much time you spend on the promotional side of the equation is is really limiting. Or if you just don't have that personality and don't like doing it. That does sound pretty powerful because like I've been told by readers that they like the sample at the back of the book but like it you know it's not the same as having that actual visual data it's just you know word of mouth and that isn't as powerful in a lot of cases and also you have to be very careful with word of mouth as an author because there's a very specific personal personality type so first of all most readers, not all of them, but most of them are introverts. And there's a very specific personality type that will actually reach out and talk to an author. And it doesn't necessarily represent your base, but we're inclined to give that person or their opinion weight because they're the one who actually reached out to us. Now, they're also probably a vocal supporter. So that is a really good thing. And you should absolutely cultivate those 
people, but they don't necessarily represent the statistical majority of your base. And that's another reason to track this kind of information, because it tells you all of the ghosts, right? Like all of the people out there who are just consuming your books who aren't talking to you, who aren't interfacing with you on social media, who may not even be on your newsletter. Um, and I, you know, I, I talk about this a lot, but I know my my numbers in terms of about what percentage I have on, um, you know, as followers on Amazon and stuff like that, because I track data so much. Um, but I also, it also means that like 1% actually will communicate with you. 10% is probably who's on your newsletter of your reader base. Like, and so all the other people that are just out there buying and consuming your books, uh, the only way you know anything about them is if you try to track them at least a little bit, which I know they hate. <laughs> but we need to know them and, and why they do the things that they do. Otherwise, how can we entertain them and please them as authors, which is presumably... Um, what what we want to do we want to make them happy our readers at least I do yeah definitely you know when you're linking to stuff on social media um, I have heard a lot of people say that your best bet is to send them straight to the retailer but do you think it's actually better to send them to that redirect page on your own Website. This is something that I track. <laughs> so I've heard this as well. And so I was like, well, this is an interesting question. So this is the kind of thing that I will use ad targeting for. So I was like, okay, let's build a bunch of ad targets where we do, uh, we specifically target, this was back in the day when you could do this kind of thing on Facebook, Kindle users, and then Kobo, and then Apple, and then Barnes and Noble, and then, um, you know, direct to consumer or whatever else things you want to track put a direct buy link that I track via redirection that um, goes directly to that platform. And then also do a broader target, which just has like a books to read landing page. So the accepted argument is that the more clicks a consumer has to get through and the more options they are given, psychologically too many options yields up overwhelm and uh, like too many click actions is attrition, so people will leave before they complete the process. So having a landing page like Books to Read or a landing page that is generated by your own website that causes people to then have to make a secondary choice or a secondary click means you lose buyers, right? So this is like a very complicated thing to try and statistically track, and I did my best. But again, for me and my readers, there was no difference. So it was the exact same number click to conversion whether I funneled them through a landing page or not. Uh, and I took that as an excuse to always use a landing page forever uh, because they are so easy <laughs> and I like them so much. And That's really um, good to hear as a wide author as well because it's less yes. work. And also if you are a multiple edition author. So the other thing that's great about a landing page now, at least the books to read offers, is that they will include audiobooks and print books. So you're not um, ignoring those readers. And I, I talk about this a lot with, re with reader magnets or, or newsletter bait, um, which is you should, if you are wide and if you are multiple editions, which if you are hybrid and come out of trad, you are, whether you like it or not, you should be offering bait that accesses all different kinds of readers. So you want to offer something like early access to an audiobook as well as a digital exclusive or a freebie or whatever. And you want to offer the occasional like five signed special editions, you know, first come first serve kind of thing. Pay to play. Like it, I feel like it's okay to offer exclusives to your newsletter that are paid exclusives, so long as they're exclusive. Just to make sure you're sort of satisfying not just the readers of all your different series, is, but um, the, re the readers who consume in different ways. And the Books to Read landing page does that for me. It, it also satisfies all of those readers. So I'm not constantly answering the question, yes, but what about the print edition? <laughs> I can be like, huh? huh? Here it is. So even when I post like, the Solace is on sale for two ninety nine, dollars right? I'll, I'll post that occasionally because I'll just be like, it's a great onboarding book. It's for sale for cheap. It's a traditionally published book, so it's rarely for sale for cheap. But it's it's an ebook. It's the ebook that's on sale for two ninety nine, and I'll and it's for the U.S. market only. And I'll say that. Uh, but the link I use is the Books to Read landing page uh, because it's possible that 
it's the first time somebody has learned about Solus and they're actually a print reader and they're still interested in buying it. So might as well have those links there. And like I said, I did run, I did two waves of testing on a launch to see whether that that landing page click through really did have an, a psychological impact and it did not on my pre-order readers. So which are the ones I can track. Um, so yeah, so I think perhaps that's old data. I think maybe that that data is that rumor that having the landing page and not using a direct link is 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 from it's from you know maybe five or six years ago um, and that people are now accustomed to buyers are now accustomed to a landing page and a little bit more familiar with it um, and it's also possible I should caution that you know it depends on your readers and where they're centered but also what kind of advertising campaign you're running so if you're running a specifically a, a sort a certain kind of advertising campaign you might want to specifically target just Kindle readers or something you might want to change your verbiage depending on which marketplace you're going to target and stuff like that so um, I haven't really looked into that side of the data. Excellent. It all makes perfect sense, Gil. I am certain that all of our listeners are converts to tracking all of this data now. <laughs> In which case then, obviously we're going to have some of our listeners who have never done any of this before. What would be your advice on where to start? You know, what would you suggest to someone who's completely new to tracking? Um, so like I said, like focus on those ones that are like, they come kind of established with the, with the platform that you're already on, like your WordPress, your Google, you're on Google, whether you like it or not. Um, and Amazon and places like that. Um, and there's lots of really good, if, if you're a YouTube person, there's good YouTube videos that will teach you how to access this stuff and how to think about it and, and stuff like that. Um, there are blog posts. So on and so forth. So there's definitely lots of great resources out there to get you started. Like I said, there are four author forums and discussion groups where if you want an aggregator that's going to do a lot of this for you, that's sort of more plug and chug, you can look into that as well. And, and then I guess the other thing I would say is um, when you're doing that kind of preliminary research to decide how you're going to set it up and where you want to start, that just like think about the person whose advice you're taking. So the reason that I keep codiciling what I say is that my perspective is very much my perspective and other people who teach about this are gonna be the same. So if the person who's teaching about it is exclusive to KU, they're gonna have a different perspective on what data needs to be acquired. So like you, you do have to think about um, the agent of trust whose advice you are taking. So you know that's just a little caution. So for example, one of the questions I often ask with author gurus in particular is, are they actually selling well in fiction or are they actually making the bulk of their money on educating authors, which is technically nonfiction? So that's <laughs> kind of something to think about. Um, and what, you know, what is their approach? And also what counts as good numbers for them so that you can like, for example, and, and I have a unique perspective on this, which is I know my own numbers and what's good for me and what's a good sales month for me and a not so good sales month for me. And that means it's not really worth it for me to take advice from an author who sell, sells less well than I do, because their tactics are obviously something I'm probably already employing or um, or not germane to my career. So yeah, that's that's like one thing. The other thing I would say is even if you're at the very beginning of your career, getting these systems in place and really thinking about it early on, at least the, a few of them, it's a little bit like getting a newsletter started early in that the habit that you're building for yourself as a career author is almost more important than the data you're actually collecting because you're going to train yourself to know what's normal for you. And this is a mistake that a lot of authors who advertise make, which is they don't know what their flat line is or their baseline or their clean catch or whatever scientific term, <laughs> term you want to use. They don't know what their organic, normal, everyday sales are like without advertising. And it's really important that you know that so that you know when you do something, if it's effective or not, <laughs> right? So like, I know exactly how much I sell in on a weekly basis, just on my backlist without doing anything at all, without a launch, et cetera, et cetera, which is how I can confidently say a truth, which is universally acknowledged, which is when you have a new book out, the long tail effect on all of your other books in that series is profound. So the newest book is the most powerful promotional tool that you have because yeah, 
I watch that new book in the series, Spike, and then I watch all of the spikes in any other books that are in that series. And the only way I can confidently say I get triple sales on the second book in the series or whatever is because I know what my baseline sales are. <laughs> and so if you're going to do something like I was talking about where you track a launch on different social media platforms, you need to know what your average sales are in a pre-order before you know whether you have a spike or not. So I run data on BookBub offers a paid sales promotion on the pre-order of a new book. Now they already will send out a new release information to your followers on BookBub, but they also offer you the author the option of paying to reach those people ahead of time. And I was like, well, let's see if that's actually effective or if I'm already catching those people via the freebie that BookBub does for me. Um, and it turns out that like, calculation, calculation, but it turns out that if my book is priced $4.99 or higher, it makes sense for me to pay for that pre-order email. But if it's lower than $4.99, it doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, I don't I don't recoup my losses on a, within the BookBub ecosystem. Another great, like I, I just love this stuff so much, but another great thing is I have done and always do encourage during my offboarding process of or unsubscribe process of my newsletter, people who just want new release information to either follow me on Amazon or follow me on BookBub. And that's because those two vendors send out uh, new release info. So essentially they do it for me because I don't offer that to my newsletter. I don't offer the option of just joining and only getting new release info. You either join for my monthly newsletter or you don't. And if you join for my monthly newsletter, you get the new release info. But if you just want that for me, you can go follow me on Amazon. You can go follow me on BookBub. And that's because there are always going to be people who hate newsletters and you want them to know about your new books no matter what, right? <laughs> so if they're not going to be part of your newsletter, just try and keep them and if you have to farm them out to a second party or a middleman, fine. Uh, but another reason for this is it means that for ever since I joined Author Central, which would be, I guess, and BookBub, which would be 2016, ever since then, I've been directing anybody who I can't catch onto my newsletter to those two venues in every part of social media, my website, offboarding process, everything, which means I have about, say, 5,000, 6,000 maybe followers on BookBub. But Amazon, because it's Amazon, doesn't tell me how many followers I have. But both of these vendors send out pre-order or, or uh, new book release or right. Uh, but they also send out pre-order releases. So Amazon does it automatically for if you're above a certain number of followers, we think. And sometime within the two week window before your book comes out, we think. <laughs> That's why is it going to be so secretive? Why is it all smoke and mirrors? Just I don't know. They tell don't people want what's going on. I know, I know. Um, but by running a couple of BookBub pre-orders that I could track using all of my sneaky methods, I've been able to calculate the percentage of the people who follow me on BookBub who actually buy off a pre-order. Um, and that's just very, like, I know, like, many authors, like, don't really care about this kind of thing. But this is very interesting data for me to have. And I'm like, yes, I actually know about how many Amazon followers I have. And that's not information that Amazon is willing to give me. But I'm pretty confident I know about how many it is. Um, that's excellent. That's... You're taking the power back from them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're not going to tell me, but I'm going to figure it out anyway. <laughs> mm. Shouldn't have to, but you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What would you say to someone who kind of is feeling like, yeah, okay, I really want to do this, but this is, do you know what? I'm shit in a brick right now. I'm absolutely <laughs> terrified. Like, what would be your tips for someone who's just feeling a little bit scared of the concept of bringing in something very technical and logical in what is often seen as a very creative career path? I think, I mean, this is hard for me to talk to. Um, it's a little because I'm I'm I've described myself as one of those weird uh people who has a muse but she's in a very tidy box like I'm very I'm like the weird thing that happens when a scientist becomes a creative right um I exist in this social science sphere which allows me to be this aggregate of of a humanities and a scientist type 
Um, so it's very natural for me to systemize. But like the fact is, especially if you're going to do indie in any way, you have to learn systems. Like you're going to be inputting data to a vendor. Even if you're just using Amazon, you have to figure out Amazon categories and keywords. You're going to like, and this, uh, yes, those are verbs, but really they're they're bits of information that you're inputting and and using numbers is is just like bits of information being inputted it's it's not that different so in a way it's kind of like a necessary evil um the other thing to realize is um if this makes you comforted is it's just it applies to you like you don't have to share it with anybody. You don't have to get it right or wrong. It's just a process of learning it until it becomes useful to you or not. It may not be useful to you and you may not like it and you may not never want to use it. Uh, but that just means that your time online or whatever it is you're trying to understand about your life is going to be less efficiently spent. And if you're okay with that, that's fine. Like if you're somebody who is on Twitter just because you enjoy Twitter, then it doesn't really matter. Uh, whether it's effective for your career or not. This is not a life or death situation. It's just very useful information to have if you want to have it and can learn about it. But yeah, and, and it, it's mostly just like to as a time saving and money saving technique. Um, and just to understand, uh, you know, when other people tell you to do something or give you pieces of advice about your career, whether it's actually going to work for, for your particular life state. But if you're the kind of person who likes to just go ahead and try it anyway and if you don't mind throwing money at something for a little while to see if it, it feels like it's working for you or not um then you, you can go ahead and do that it's, it's your money and it's your career <laughs> um so yeah I mean I think you can tell I just get bushy-tailed and bright-eyed about the idea of like really understanding it and really hacking it for myself but it, and and then being able to like challenge accepted notions of what's effective within when other people are talking about it because I I have the data to back it up right and it's only data on my own career but it's still data and that's kind of more where I am uh, kind of creatively with it uh, than anything else uh, but but like anything statistically relatable you know it can be hacked and converted and made to look good and and, and made to give the wrong information that's the nature of stats never trust a statistician that has a perspective <laughs> I think also no one cares as much about your books as you do. No one will ever care as much, no matter how much they love you. So true. Like it, yeah. it is. That's that's the hard honest truth. Um, yeah, I, I, or I, and your career. Yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, I I have talked about this, and uh, I, in fact, I have done this on panels where I've slammed my hand on tables. Um, I, I hate to tell this to you, um, little baby authors out there, but no one's on your side. <laughs> <laughs> like everyone is out to make money off of you, even your editor and your agent. And uh, you have to protect yourself. And like the numbers are one other way you protect yourself because you know what's working and what isn't working. And you don't have to trust them to tell you what's working or what isn't working. Um, you know, like, like I'll give you a really good example is uh, traditionally published authors are still put on blog tour. And and I will talk to some of my trad friends and just be like, wait, how many blog posts did you have to write about your book? Because that's all writing that they should be paid to do. But it was writing for promotion. And I get that. But my first question is like, well, how many books did you sell? Like how many pre-orders did you get from that blog post that you did, that you provided content for another blog? Like, and... Did you have a codicil that allowed you to own that content that you wrote and republish it, say, on your own blog, to Pinterest, to all of these other places where you could have used it to redirect traffic at least back to your website and onto your newsletter, if nothing else? But, like, just changing your brain to be like, I spent an hour writing and editing this blog post, which I could have spent writing, was it actually effective? And sure, your publisher is going to tell you that it's effective and the host blog venue is going to tell you that it's effective. But uh, that's just because it was something they didn't have to create, right? They made you create it. And there's a very good possibility that you entirely wasted your time doing that thing. Um, because, uh, because, yeah, so like I will do something like... Uh, 
sure, I'll write a blog post for you or, you know, do an advertising thing or whatever. But either I have the tracking code for the sales for that. And it's fine with me if you want to use your affiliate codes or whatever, but I still get to track it via my website or, and, and you'll just give me your, the affiliate code links or what have you. Or I get entire access to that content to repurpose. Uh, because for me, because I'm, I'm very good at like figuring out how to util utilize my content, like that's often even more effective than the blog post. Blog post just spearheaded me to write marketing copy basically. Now, how can I use that marketing copy? But I very rarely do guest blogging anymore. But yeah, I mean, like even if you're, so what I'm saying is even if your publisher is like making you do it, like really think about whether it's an effective use of your time. Yeah, I've heard very mixed things about blog tours these days. It seems to be, from what I can gather, genre specific but i don't know how recent that um is because i don't know any authors who do them really yeah hard. it's really kind of one of those things that trad authors do a lot of and um and i'm just like i just don't i haven't done it in so many years that i'm like i just don't i just i personally just don't believe that it's effective but i have would have to do one and track it to find out whether it is effective and um yeah, I mean, my temptation is to say newer authors, newer genres, introducing yourself to a a blog that specifically focuses on that genre might be good, but, you know, ask that blog how many eyeballs it has, how many readers it gets, what its average click-through is on other blogs of this type, those kinds of questions, so you know whether they are tracking their effectiveness and <laughs> whether you think it would be for you. And I know that's a weird thing to do because, um, you know, sometimes we're often so grateful as authors to get the option of like, oh my God, you know, but it might not be really worth it. Um, I, I suspect blog tours, I should say at this point. <laughs> Is it ever too late in someone's career for them to start implementing this tracking? No. Um, yeah, that's an easy answer, no. Uh, and, you know, if you're overwhelmed by the options, just start with one. Just start with the bit of information you're the most interested in at the moment. So, like, if you're a traditionally published author who's been publishing for a decade and, and maybe you've been blogging also for over a decade, perhaps you should be tracking your blog numbers to see how many people are visiting, how many sales you get off of a blog post, that kind of information. Um, if you're like a trad author, I I'm writing a nonfiction book right now, which is for traditionally published authors who are interested in transitioning to self-publishing. And I'm like, the, the thing you need to implement and track, as far as I'm concerned, the most is your newsletter. So, you know, that's the thing that I would get familiar with and set up first if you're starting out or even if you're mid-career. Like if even if you have an incredibly impactful newsletter and it's really, really effective, start tracking what's going on inside that newsletter. So start using redirect links on the links within your newsletter. Start doing things which you might maybe not think about. Like if you have images in your newsletter, there should be links in those images, which are tracked separately. They're an image link from a book link, which will let you know if it's worth it to put those images into your newsletter because images can damage open rates and stuff like that. I think, I'm not sure on that one. I haven't delved into the data. Newsletter data can be very difficult to access. Yeah, I, I heard something interesting the other day, actually. I think it was in the Newsletter Ninja Facebook group. And someone asked about, you know, um, newsletter software automatically includes social media icons and you put your links in. And someone asked, like, will I get penalized for this? And a lot of people said yes. I don't agree with including them, uh, actually. I would argue that you shouldn't have them anyway. Why do you want people to leave your newsletter and follow you on social media? That seems like a terrible idea because you're moving eyeballs you control into a sphere where you could be shut down at any second, right? Facebook can cook you, kick you off in a red hot minute. So can Twitter. You don't want to offboard to social media. You, you, that's, that's, mm. yeah, I'm like, no, don't do that. Um, so yeah, I've removed them from everywhere. I've removed them from back of book. That's a lot of information we've covered, which is I know. amazing. Um, 
What would you say to someone though who thinks that they can accurately track their success with these various different things just in their head without without tracking it on your magical spreadsheets as you mentioned? Well, I think, like I said, uh, you're biased. So one of the things that data collection tells us is where our biases lie, um, and biases including how we as authors are biased in favor of certain platforms as effective for us or not, that kind of thing. And the only way to access your own bias biases and know whether you're correct or not in how you're effectively spending your time and your creative energy is to accurately track it. Um, you know, so I might like uh, Twitter a lot and enjoy playing there, which I certainly have done in the past, but that might bias me towards thinking it's actually an effective platform for me when in the end it turns out for me that it absolutely was not. Um, and, and then so this is why you kind of like need your baseline, because your baseline is giving you information not only on your demographics and your analytics, but also on your own, um, how your own opinions about these things have influenced you. Now, I, I will say with social media in particular, that like the primary reason to have these two out the, the T part of want, the two places where you play on social media, is that they do act as kind of conduits to get people towards your website and, and, and testing grounds and stuff like that. And so I tend to advise that you pick social media platforms that you do actually enjoy using because you need to be on them and using them and engaging with them in order to have them be an effective test ground <laughs> and a fertile test ground. So if video and TikTok is your jam, then like freaking play on TikTok, like go to it. You know, just use your redirection every time there's a link going. It, Instagram, whatever it is you like. The most important thing with us introverted authors by and large is to make sure we actually do the thing. So <laughs> hacking your own personality is the first thing. Data can help you hack your own biases, but you don't have data if you're not actually creating <laughs> somewhere, right? So like, like the first responsibility of an author is to write the next book, is to get the next actual piece of content that you want to be your livelihood out in the world. That is the best thing for tracking. Right? That is the best data you can have. Uh, so yeah, so that's important. But also, like if you are somebody who's a little bit ooh shiny like me and likes to experiment with, with all the new platforms and investigate the new things, then actually tracking your data in all these different spaces can tell you where better to focus your time if you're if you're a little loosey goosey, which which I am. Um, so like, I genuinely enjoy a lot of social media. I know that's a terrible confession to make, but I do like it. Uh, I like my fans a lot. Like they're my people. I would go shopping with them. I know we would hang out. We have hung out. Um, like they're great. I like hanging out with them wherever they exist on the internet. Um, so I could and have spent like all day on social media. So one of my reasons for tracking data is to stop myself from doing that and actually write. Because again, like many writers, I'll do anything not to write. And I need to track data so I don't have the excuse. <laughs> like, no, I don't get to check Twitter because guess what? Twitter doesn't work for me. So nope. <laughs> uh, I should sit down and type. <laughs> It's a very diplomatic answer. I would have gone way harsher and just said, there's no fucking way you can remember all of it. Write it yeah. down. Uh <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. That's very, very true. Um, but yeah, I mean, like tracking your data can help you decide. Like I have a whole list of things here. Um, it, it helps you know your baseline before you start any kind of campaign, whether that's a launch campaign or an advertisement campaign. So like, that's one reason to do it. It helps you decide whether to make a pivot or a change. Like you can use data tracking to see whether your existing audience, if you have one, is really willing to follow you when you try a new genre, for example, or how much work it's gonna be to get them to try a new genre, how experimental. Like if you're like me, I love experimenting with things. So like um, I always take, especially in the indie sphere and especially Amazon doing something crazy as an excuse to see how I can pivot. So Amazon decides it's gonna delay audiobooks in the middle of lockdown for, what was it? Like half a year, six months, eight months for some of us. So you would upload an audiobook and it would just not go live for months. And so what do I do? I go look at Amazon's terms of service and it turns out that you're only exclusive to them when it's up. So I'm like, it's not up yet. I'm not exclusive. What am I gonna do? I'm gonna directly sell the MP3 of my audiobook as a newsletter exclusive until Amazon posts it live. 
So it's like a magic. This can end at any time. Uh, but until then, you can buy the audio. If you're an audiobook person, you can buy and own the audiobook assets. And Audible subscribers in particular love this because they don't feel like they own those assets and they feel like Amazon can take them away from them at any time because Amazon has done this to them. And so they're like, su my super fans at least, are really excited to actually own the audiobook. Um, so I just did that during this one phase and it was wildly successful. And I'm charging full price for the audiobook. I mean, they're expensive to produce. So it's, you know, like 15 bucks or whatever it is for a full book. But my super fans are just delighted. So now, two weeks before I post an audiobook onto Amazon, it sells exclusively for my newsletter for that window of time. You have to be on the newsletter. You never know when it's going to happen. But suddenly they'll just be gals like, oh, you want the MP3s? They're on sale until this date and then I'm posting it to Amazon and then it's exclusive to Amazon for seven years. Uh, so jump on it while you can, um, that kind of thing. Um, so like me being willing to experiment was just a fun thing that has been trained into me, but, and here's the data, it did not impact my Audible sales at all. Not slightly, not even slightly. And so I went and asked my audience and uh, most of my audiobook people were just like, yeah, I bought it, but then I also listened to it, to it on Audible. So I also spent my Audible chips on it because I'm already in that ecosystem and I just wanted to listen to it that way. But I just delighted that I own it so that, you know, if anything ever goes wrong, I still have it. Um, and that's because, you know, I have a great track record with audiobooks. I have multiples out there. They trust me, all of those sorts of things. But also I was like, oh, so basically you buy it twice. Um, and that sort of has to do with the psychology of subscription services as well. When people are in subscription services, they think of the product as kind of free and forget that they're paying for it in a different way. But yeah, so that was revelatory. And, uh, and it just caused me to, you know, pivot and change my business model. Um, so, you know, that's the other thing that data allows you. It, it, data allows you to take experiments and pivots and risks and all of these words that... Um, businesses use all the time uh, but really be able to track whether it's effective or not I love it that's genius overcoming the bullshittery and <laughs> making it work for you that's fantastic yeah, it's so much fun now so like whenever something goes wrong I'm like ooh, uh, like what does this say about the industry how can I like try an experimental project to see to see, you know, how much of an impact it's going to have on my career, et cetera. So for example, like, again, we're, this is a very long conversation, but um, we haven't really talked about advertising, but I, for example, am more likely to um, use advertising at this juncture to test what's e effective in selling my backlist. So rather than a front list thing. So I because I believe in this sort of clean catch idea of like really having a baseline and then testing things off of that baseline, that means I need to know the baseline, which means I'm mostly working off of my backlist because I know the baseline of my backlist books very, very well. So when I do promotions or whatever, it's usually backlist, first in series, that kind of thing. But I also never do stacked promotions. And I understand stacking promotions is a huge thing for a lot of indie authors. But for me, I can't track it well enough. So I'm just, don't do it. Like, <laughs> so like, that's another, like, I also rarely do advertising on a launch because again, I can't track my organic launch sales if I'm advertising on that launch. Um, this is something that like, if it were the third book in a series or something, I might consider and I were rapid releasing that book or, you know, that I had other comparisons that had come prior to to deal with but um but generally speaking so you know some other uh, big data collector type authors advice on things like stacking promo promos and stuff like that i don't give that advice which doesn't mean it's not good advice it just means that like i like to track so much that it actually influences what career risks i will take so that i mean guess i guess that's just a a warning to um say uh, and, and the other thing is, um, because I'm so multifaceted in onboarding to my newsletter, so I have like the usual things that everybody has for a newsletter, like a freebie or bait or exclusives or whatever, but I also do a lot of like a goodie box, which is just one box, but it's a random number generated to anybody who wants to try out the box and it will be full of tea and fun things and assigned, multiple signed books and stuff like that. But I will track 
how effective those kinds of things are at getting people on to my newsletter, um, which is how I know I should keep doing them because it turns out that as effective as something like a perennial freebie or bait can be, um, actually a one-off big ticket physical item uh, works a lot better on my base in, in getting people signed up. Um, and also encouraging my existing subscribers to talk about secret bits of information that are included in the newsletter on social media. So on Twitter or more importantly for me on my Facebook group, um, that gets FOMO like a, like crazy. Um, and then I onboard a bunch of new signups as well. And again, I learn all of this from tracking. <laughs> well, it's safe to say you are a genius, Gail. Um, <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> we do say the most important question to last, but you've already been here before. Mm. So we can't ask you which book changed your life. Yeah. Um, we changed it slightly this time, and we want to know which data source changed your life. What was the most pivotal for your career? That's really hard because I came into being a career author kind of with this skill set in play, and I understand that. Like, like I understand I have an advantage from my previous career. And so, you know, I was already inclined to look at things like Facebook analytics or what have you. Um, but I actually, this is a weird one, but I, I think I will say Facebook analytics because they're constantly changing it, which is very annoying. But um, learning to interface with it via my page um, was so effective for me to, to see when they made a change, the negative impact it had on, on my reach, on, on my sales, on all of these things. And like that, for me, that was very educational in how a social media platform or a middleman, which is what they are for us, they're middlemen for, they're a funnel through which we are attempting to reach our readers can really detrimentally impact you. And because I come from trad, I didn't have like, Amazon data and all that sort of thing at first. So I was mostly working with social media data. Um, and so Facebook Zero was really profound for me when that was instituted. I can't remember when that was. I feel like it was 2017, 2018, maybe. That was a huge thing where I was like, oh, they made one tweak to their algorithm and just, I watched my posts and interactions and comments just tank. And I could Just from see one that. small little tweak they made. Just from one tweak that they made. And I was like, oh, oh that's, the power is amazing. And that really showed me kind of just how important it is to look at those analytics. And because that was the moment I was like, oh, I don't need to spend time on my page. Like spending time on my page is now a waste of my time. Like Facebook has effectively made it that way. So I'm going to pivot and spend time on my group. And then Facebook has been recently really upping how much they promo groups because they're preparing to advertise to them. So they want them to be little ecospheres. Uh, but in my case, it's been great. Uh, my group has been going gangbusters. It's now 40,000 strong, which makes it a very That's fertile testing ground. Yeah, <laughs> excellent. But not all of them are my actual readers. It's just that that group is really active and they talk about fun things that connect to my book. But I am starting to see people join the group and then buy my books because they're like, wait, there's an author connected to this? And I'm like, oh, look at you little group being effective. So that's an interesting, you know, pivot to watch occur. But yeah, so for me, it was Facebook analytics and it was Facebook analytics that encouraged me to look into Google analytics and my website and to really think about how that fits. And then because of that, I started to pay very much more close attention to my newsletter and because I got so scared about how Facebook could just throttle me like that, um, that's when I really started to like activate my newsletter in a big way. I was really late to the newsletter game, um, which I think a lot of traditional authors are. It's my great regret. Uh, but um, but yeah, so I, I, it was kind of, for me, it was sort of a moment where I realized that this skill set I had was actually really germane to my current career and existence in a way that I hadn't really thought about and could maybe turn to my advantage. <laughs> um, but I will say you you have um, which data, you said which data source changed your life. Um, and I would say the tool that did it was WordPress's redirection, which I mentioned. We'll before. go with tool then, because that was actually yeah. 
not what I expected you to say. I thought you were going to go yeah. back to the redirection thing that you were talking about yeah. WordPress, because that's yeah. obviously made such a difference. But Yeah, the thing that made me rethink data in general as applied to being an author was that moment with Facebook. Um, yeah. But the tool that's been the most impactful in a positive way on my life in general is the redirection plugin. Fantastic. Where can our lovely listeners go then if they want to find out a bit more about you, maybe fangirl over some <laughs> analytics? If I haven't scared, terrified you and scared you away, um, I should say that like one of the things that all of this data has taught me, um, and also it's it's kind of my native personality anyway, is that uh, when I am on social media and I am interacting in general with the greater public, it is with my readers. So everything has a point of view for my readers. I very rarely do blog posts or talk specifically about the author business side of the equation. I absolutely will do that when I do like presentations at conferences or for writers groups and stuff like that. Um, I love to teach the business side of writing, but my author brand, for lack of a better term, does not really encompass that. Um, so there's a little corner of my website, which has nonfiction. And uh, I have the one, The Heroine's Journey, which is a sort of craft narrative structure book. Um, and then I'm, I'm working on, on a new book, which is more for the business side of the equation. Um, but neither of these really talk about this aspect. So yeah, I have some, I do have a resources tab, which basically has links to different tools that I find really effective, things like the blog post about redirection. Occasionally, I will feel compelled to post about something that no one else is talking about, <laughs> because I just need to point other authors at a place on the internet, which is often how I use my blog. So I do have some resources. So if you go to my website and you go to, there's a ta there's a drop down that basically has my resources in it. So um, if you're a newer author, there's a bunch for you. And if you're, you're a more established author, there's a bunch for you there as well. So that's where I would say to go. Um, as I continue with this new book I'm writing, there's going to be a lot more resources because one of the things that book has is a lot of resources and tool testing and stuff. Um, so accidentally on purpose, there will be more. Uh, but at the moment, that's the best thing to do. Um, however, you are absolutely welcome to do things like subscribe to my newsletter or follow me on social media or whatever. If you'd like to see how I'm doing it and what I'm doing, um, if you would like to see my crafty little uh, surveys that get dropped on occasion. Um, I have to say I'm very like open with my readers about this kind of thing where I'll just be like, look, I'm considering doing this thing. And I just want your opinions on it for gathering survey data. Um, and so, you know, they're kind of used to me at this juncture, but all of this is galecarriger.com. So that's where you go for everything. And I hope you find something useful and helpful. And I really hope I haven't totally overwhelmed everybody, but I trust, like, it really can be very fun. Like, <laughs> it's really so interesting to actually delve into what is working about how you run your own career and what isn't working. Um, and it really can help you make smart choices, which I hope all of us want to be able to make about our careers. I'm sure. I'm sure we do. And I know that they'll find amazing resources on your website. So we will <laughs> definitely be including that in the show notes for you. But yeah, thank you so much for joining us, Gail. It's been absolutely incredible amount of information you've shared. I can't believe we just went through all of that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for inviting me which was really me we didn't say this at the beginning but I basically was I basically pressed getting that to letting me come on I was like please let me talk about this I, I mean it, it so didn't much. take didn't take that much persuasion we we mentioned in an episode we wanted to talk about it and then you're like hi i'll talk about it look at all of these things I know all of that. Uh, so yeah we were like oh my god girl wants to come back yes um so it was, Seriously, it was an easy decision <laughs> thank you so it's, so much girl thank you so much for letting me um i never get to talk like this and it it, it really is uh, very near and dear to my heart so oh. it's been a pleasure thank you thank you If you found this episode interesting or helpful, make sure you subscribe to The Writer's Mindset on YouTube or your favourite podcast platform. Or all of them, we don't mind. Everything from a like to a rating to a review to a subscribe to shouting about us on social media helps us to reach more writers so that they can overcome the mindset issues that are holding them back with their writing too. If you're on social media, come join us on Instagram at writersmindsetpod. 
or join our Facebook group, which you can find by searching for The Writer's Mindset. And don't forget to come join us over on Patreon for our bonus series, Healthy Habits. See you next time. Keep writing. Keep writing.